Constructed Criticism is sponsored by Oasis Games. MTGOasis.com is the place to get cards for your next Magic event. Try them out with code CCMTG for 15% off of your first order, and use the code Would That Be Good for 4% off of every order. Want to support the show directly? Head on over to patreon.com slash ccmtg to check out some awesome benefits and future goals for the show. Thanks for listening, and here's this week's episode of Constructed Criticism. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Constructed Criticism Network. This network is here to help you improve in Magic the Gathering at every level. From popper leagues to top 1000 mythic, we've got you covered. If you want to hear the entire network, head on over to our sponsor at pureintgeo.com, where you can hear each and every show, each and every week, and check out their sponsor, MDGO Traders, and tell them that the CCMTG Network sent you. Now sit back, enjoy the show, from YouTube, podcasts, and more, here's this week's episode from ConstructedCriticism.com. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 390th episode of Constructed Criticism. I am your full of eggs host, Mason, joined by my two co-hosts, Abe and Spencer. What do you all have for dinner tonight? I think that carrots are the best part of pot roast by a substantial margin, and anyone who disagrees is kind of crazy. Like, the fact that carrots soak up the flavors of everything else so well... I, I, it blows my mind that anybody picks another part of the pot roast to be better. It's kind of insane to me that some people say that potatoes aren't the best part of the pot roast because potatoes just have this amazing texture Dude, and they're just so delicious. It's, it's so true. Like <laughs> I'm like the potato guy. I love potatoes more than anything else in the world. And somehow... And you're still picking carrots? And somehow only in pot roast do I pick carrots over potatoes. That is that is kind of wild. I'm a, huge, I'm a huge potato guy. I'm also a huge scrambled egg guy. I just scrambled eggs this morning. I'm really, I'm really bridging the gap between all worlds here. Real recognize real. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just sauteed some vegetables, put some eggs in there, call it a day. Here to game. Here to talk about our wish list and things we want to hopefully see and work on this coming year for Magic. That's gonna be today's episode. But first, we do need to do always improving. That is the main point of the show. And Abe, I believe it's your turn to go first. Yeah, so uh, my always improving this week has been spending some time consuming content and picking the brain of uh, people around me. Most notably, Misplaced Ginger on Twitch. Uh, he's been streaming a bunch of the trophy race stuff, and I've really watched a lot of him play the Grixis Shadow deck, a deck that I hadn't really put many reps into, or an archetype I hadn't really put many reps into since uh, Modern Horizons 2. And so, you know, getting to compare notes on how I felt about things that he was doing in sideboarding or some of his ideas in deck building versus his experiences with so many matches played and kind of seeing what his thought process was, what mine was and lining those up. I feel like I've really learned a lot about that archetype this week. Really just kind of refreshing to have a moment of uh, taking in something new uh, and, and comparing notes uh, with, with someone without having to like put a bunch of hours into playing myself and still feel like I'm getting a lot out of it. Yeah. You get to kind of farm from XP, you know, it's yeah. kind of like a mobile game. You leave them on an idle, you go do your thing, you come back, you get your rewards. It's great. Yeah, you check those sideboarding decisions, see if you agree or disagree, and then you're like, I kind of disagree. Like, what, what's up? What's the what's the idea here? And you get to get to talk it out. Great way to improve in general, just watching people play. So, Yeah, so mine has been similar-ish, but it's been about me kind of going in the trenches. Uh, I've been trying to work on and look at decks in Modern that are kind of not quite there, but are very close to being great decks. So, you know, Bring the Light, uh, the kind of the controlling scape shift deck, and Yawgmoth are the two decks that I've been the most kind of digging my teeth into. There have been a couple other ones. Uh, and specifically for Yawgmoth, I've played a lot of it over the last four days or so, really trying to get a hand on the deck. I actually bought all the cards from our proud sponsor, Oasis Games. And so, you know, I'm excited to play it in paper. It's really fun. But yeah, I, I just try to get in there just so I can have a better understanding of those decks and kind of do my homework, you know, and kind of like the way that a mentioned how, you know, with death shadow, uh, kind of hadn't played it, had some, you know, thoughts about it before how things change, checking back in. It's kind of doing that myself with these decks that way when you know, something does change or the time is right for these sort of decks, I can kind of hop on them and uh, be ready to go. And so I've reached the point now where I can tell you how Yawgmoth works in detail and not like I recognize when I'm dead versus when I'm not dead. Fun fact, by the way, in case you're listening and you're trying to always figure out, like, am I dead in this Jaroth Messenger or not? If you're both at the same life total, but it's even, Messenger kills you. But if it's odd, they kill themselves. So, little fun fact there. 16, you're dead. 17, you're okay. 
fun little facts. There you go. Spencer, what about you? Yeah, I've mostly been working on standard uh, again. I was looking at modern deck lists and stuff like that, and but you know, as as I was kind of looking towards, I was interested in doing a magic. You know, p- part of that for me is wanting to make deck decks, and I feel like standard is at that place where everybody's like, "Oh, it's solved. We don't have to do anything," and I don't believe that that's true. Um, and so I've been working on blue black control pretty heavily. I have not lost a match to blue red whether it be on ladder or whether it be in events in quite a while i think that the hardest matchups for blue black control right now are actually depending on how you tune either mono green or mono white because those decks present such different threats that it can actually be pretty tough to combat both of them with the deck with the way that this kind of the sweepers line up especially because i think that the snow version is correct which makes mono white even harder to play against so it, it's something that I've been working on. I tried tons of different versions of the deck, just trying to work out the flux slots and stuff like that. And I hope to do a deck tech on it this week. Witches, no witches. Is that like kind of where you're at? Yeah. Or is it... So I, if I would have to pull my list, but I think right now I'm on three witches, two Lear, one HBH. Yeah. In the main, the, the thing that is kind of different in my list, I think I talked about this a couple weeks ago, but I'm pretty high on, some number of blood chiefs thirst over like the four fading hope type of stuff i think i think the fading hope is really good at protecting your stuff but like the format is so aggressive trying to beat the other decks that you you actually have to have to play some number of blood chiefs thirst i also think that like i'm on two duress main two duress on the side small concessions to like become a really tuned blue black control list it, it's funny uh, i was talking to 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 my Best friends, former co-hosts of the show, have just really gotten back into magic in Matt Kling and Quentin Pierce. So, you know, I've been in discords with them a lot over the last couple weeks. Quinn's really high on, like, the blue-red decks. And I, I just actually can't win with that deck, mostly because of the arena algorithm, to be honest. The number of mirror matches that you play on arena is so high, no matter what deck you're playing, because of the algorithm that it's really frustrating. And the only way to get around that that I've found is to play events. And then you like sometimes play against BS decks. I don't want to play the blue-red mirror unless I specifically entombed for it. But then I think you actually are a pretty big dog to mono white, in my opinion. It's kind of tough. And I think blue-black kind of goes in between those pretty well by being like a control deck that's really good against creature decks, but like can really easily just like rip your opponent's hand to shreds. Like if you you resolve a leer in blue-black against blue-red, you basically always win kind of how it was uh when the kind of popped up at the invitation yeah uh, yeah that's what i was saying to quentin today i was like he was like you know I, have, I was having trouble i was like yeah i think you have to like specifically worry about their gal- galvanic turns and then focus on resolving your leers and the matchup becomes good for you well that's gonna do it for always improving segment let's kind of hop into our main show topic today so today on the episode what we're going to do is we kind of have like a wish list slash um goals for magic kind of hybrid episode for us so we've each picked three things that we kind of are hoping to kind of do well in or work on or come to fruition over the course of the year. And uh, I, I'll start things off. I'm going to kind of each just talk about it a little bit and have a little bit of conversation about each person's thing and then uh, send you all into the new year ready to go. Only, my friends, 39 days like Kamigawa. Time marches on. Uh, <laughs> so for, for my, my first one, improving at doing this podcast, but content creation in general, and this is kind of a more uh, niche one for kind of, you know, us in general and so i'm not going to harp on this one too long but i am kind of curious to hear what y'all think about this because it's like a big part of my life and it takes up a lot of my time and everything and i think improving at doing the podcast and writing articles and streaming and all that sort of stuff in youtube is really going to be helpful not only for myself when it comes to time efficiency and those things going well and like the benefits from those things going well but also i think for the listeners and that sort of stuff and i think if i can get better at distilling the information in more understandable and bite-sized ways that will be really helpful for a lot of people especially if i can start getting better at getting bigger picture stuff condensed because i feel like i can often get small stuff pretty easily condensed but for bigger things it's a little harder and there might not be any way to shrink the file size too much you know what i mean that's kind of one of my, my big ones. Do you have any thoughts on that, by the way? I know this one, I don't want to go too deep because a lot of our listeners aren't content creators, I'm sure. But, you know. I, I think that one thing that nine years of this podcast has taught me is that 
when you do a show like Constructed Criticism, it forces you to think about magic really critically every time you play. It can sometimes be pretty exhausting learning how to communicate that. I know that we always talk about the Hinder Father as like kind of the goat of this show, but there's a, there's a pretty good reason for that because he had such an ability to say so little to convey so much. It's a skill that's really hard to learn, but also just like the amount of work you have to put in to be able to do that is pretty big. And I, you know, I, I have different content creation goals than I have on my wish list, but like being more like Mike pun not intended is definitely one of my goals for this year as like somebody who rejoined the show, not as the host, but as, as a co-host. So I really, when you talk about reducing the file size, in the information that we're putting out, I, I, that really resonated with me. Yeah, we really want to min-max your time to everything like that. Abe, do you have any thoughts on that too? I don't want, yeah, don't I mean, I, any, uh, yeah, I, it's a constant thing for me with magic is what, what you're describing, and you know, it's definitely finding good ways and like really just simple ways of breaking down really complicated things that people understand and resonate with is a huge challenge. I feel like we've kind of all three of us been going through it with uh, every time we talk about the playtesting idea in our head thing for the last few weeks. Like we've had this idea for this episode of like, let's describe that. And I know that I've been thinking about how to describe what I do. And it's still just, it's so much where it's like, can I really get this down and can I condense it? And that skill is something that uh, I think, I think we're all getting closer to that answer when we're thinking about that one thing, making magic more accessible and making improvement easier, that much easier for people who listen to the show is definitely a, a really good goal. And I, I think it's an awesome one. So One of the things that I really love about the training grounds topics for this show is just how you can take something so little and you get you get three people that are really into Magic the Gathering strategy and we can just go off for so long. Yeah, it's, it's almost the inverse, right? It's like you we can we can extract a lot from a little file, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words situation. So yeah, yeah, it is one of the, the really cool things about not only doing the shows, but having listened to the shows as well. Where will we end up when we have this as the topic is I think always really interesting. So my next one is uh, improving at tempo decks. And I'm sure if anyone read where I, how I put these in our show notes, it's, it's freaking them out, the order which I'm jumping around. But uh, improving at tempo decks is something that I personally really want to work on uh, and as a goal for Magic. I have a pretty good baseline for most types of decks and stuff like that. I think I can play them all to like a reasonable capacity. And that wasn't always, I mean, obviously it wasn't always the case. But even in like the last few years, I worked a lot on playing aggressive decks and stuff like that and decks that are you know, like prowess, for example, the things that I would kind of shy away from before and burn. And uh, I really worked on that at the beginning of COVID about three years ago. Now I feel really comfortable with all that sort of stuff. But the one area where I feel not as good as I would like to be and needs, I think, the most work uh, outside of specific combo decks would be tempo decks. I just think in general, tempo decks have not been a thing in my history with Magic very often that were like good you know what i mean like they haven't really like rug delver was kind of on its way out for example when i was coming into magic so that's like not an experience i had and in modern tempo decks have never really been that good you know even blue red merc tide in current modern is the closest thing i think to a tempo deck i've played a lot of and that's really more of a mid-range deck you know it's not, it very rarely is actually a tempo deck in my opinion and this thing that i really want to work on because it's like this whole archetype of decks that will have its moment of being really good. And I don't want to have to play catch up when the time comes, kind of like we talked about in the always improving segment where, you know, when Yogg is good, I don't want to be the guy who's in the leagues trying to figure out how to, you know, play Yogg and figure out the combo and all that sort of stuff. I want to have that information already downloaded so that now I can play with the new busted card, you know? And so that, that that's a big one for me because I, I think that's something and also help me play against tempo decks better i think if i have a you know a better understanding it's funny if you understand things more you can <laughs> play with and against them better it's a really weird concept i was gonna say my number one tip for tempo decks is always just consider that the resource you're fighting over is the amount of turns the game lasts and so every single card you're going to spend at some point at negative advantage because you're closing the game within that that time you're ending it in stage in stage one of development or whatever so every time you're trading down just consider that it's actually for the time the intangible that that's like mm -hmm. the number one thing that when i was first learning to play like delver decks and legacy and in standard and kind of like getting my feet wet in the archetype it's archetype my understanding of that and my way to intuit that into existence gave me a lot of success back then i i would just like to add i love i love the goal you know i i similarly 
took COVID to learn a lot more about aggressive decks and my next goal is combo decks. So, you know, I, I completely feel this goal as a person. Little goal, dog? So, yeah. A little, little amulet titan? A little belcher? <laughs> yeah. So Target you? <laughs> yeah, no, we'll see. We'll see how that goes uh, and everything. It is an interesting. Uh, it kind of is interesting because I don't think there are any good tempo decks right now. But that's neither here nor there. <laughs> no, I'm going to I'm gonna have to find a tempo deck I can play a bunch of. Or we're just working on the skill somehow. This one is kind of a disingenuous one. So I, I put do well in the NRG events. But really what, what I mean is to continue to get back into the swing of things of playing tournaments and the process and staying on top of it and refining it. I think it can be very easy. Um, and this is something that, you know, Abe, I'm sure, sympathized with. And Spencer was playing GPs on back-to-back weekends or, like, even with a weekend between them. Uh, when you play a bunch of events back-to-back-to-back, it can be pretty tiring, especially when you're traveling for them to you know, other stuff going on. Like, you know, I work a full-time job and I do all this content creation, et cetera. And I want to make sure that I'm staying on top of these things so that I can be doing well in them. My, my kind of personal goal is to be in the running for the NRG player championship thingy that they're doing after the first four events. But I have to miss one of the weekends, I think, because of work stuff. So I'm going to need to do really well in the other three weekends. But that's either here or there. But I just want to make sure that, like, I was in that sort of thing and it's like, you know... Had I been able to go this weekend or had I, you know, played a little tighter, I could have been in that sort of thing and kind of wanted to, you know, make sure that I'm doing that sort of stuff or, you know, maybe even just make it if, uh, you know, things continue to go well. So really want to stay on top of that with preparation and balance of magic and not letting it, you know, fall off because it is something I've dedicated so much time to. And it can be easy to be like, ah, eh, you know, I'm going to play God of War instead, et cetera, et cetera, even though I've like, you know, bought this ticket to fly to Chicago or whatever. So that's uh, my last goal. I love it. I, I think that, like, we'll get into mine, but I have, like, kind of similar, like, the magic events that I'm playing and are dictating kind of what I'm trying to do. One piece of advice that I'll give you, Mason, uh, on the previous topic, because I wanted to double check before I said this, uh, is play some popper challenges, dude, like, for the tempo goal, because, like, wall scred and blue black delver can be the control deck in that format. Mm-hmm. They're really often tempo decks. Um, same with mono blue. So that, that could be something that really helps you understand uh, the macro archetype pretty well. That's true. That's a four. I forget that's a real form. I wonder if Pioneer has tempo decks. Uh, I looked at historic popper and alchemy before I opened my mouth. I did not look mm-hmm. at Pioneer. Um, but but popper also is just like a really great competitive format right now. Uh, really fun. A lot of different decks and a lot yeah. of room for play. Just like every other Brainstorm format. So... My only big gripe about Popper right now is that it feels like the format is kind of warped in the direction of Affinity and decks that can, like, Stone Rain Affinity six times to be able to beat them. Yeah, and I mean, that the, kind the, of sucks, but the, the core gameplay around Popper at all times is very, very good. Like, like outside of that dynamic, all of the non Affinity matchups, I think, are, are always really interesting and always really, uh, really great places to refine your skills as a magic player and stuff. So, yeah, I'll kind of add on to your, your NRG one because, like, you know, looking at the next year, I, I still am probably not ready to go back to the grind the way I did before I had kids. Maxwell's getting old enough where, like, I feel comfortable leaving my wife alone with him. But, like, you know, we got a baby again. So, kind of looking at the the future of my magic, it'll be when GPs come back, going to a couple of those. But, like, I really do plan on playing all of the 1Ks in my area next year. And I'd like to kind of get back to form. You know, I was... Top eighting well over 80% of the 1Ks uh, in my area before COVID. And I'd like to kind of keep on pace with that. And that would kind of be one of my measurable, actionable goals. I think I said this a couple episodes ago where, like, people have asked me about the 1Ks locally. Like, how, Spencer, how do you do so well? And, you know, what is your goal when you go? And I was like, well, my goal is to win. But, like, that's not really the goal. Like, the goal is to put myself in a position to win. And the way that you do that is to to top eight. You can't win if you don't top eight. There's a couple of things that you can do to do that, right? Like picking a good deck, making good mulligan decisions, having a sideboard plan for your deck, uh, stuff like that. And so for me, this means playing more modern, uh, playing more pioneer and playing more sealed uh, are the ways that this is going to happen for me uh, because those are the most popular 1K formats in my area. Goal number one, and the rest of mine are kind of wish list things. Uh, I took this more of a wish list episode than I did a a goals episode. Mason Mo- just grinds. He's just yeah, got the huge grind. Yeah, it's true. He, he, he really does. Can't help but want more for himself. Yeah, it's it's yeah. 
sure. really, really making the rest of us look bad here, Mason. I have some advice for you, by the way. I ran into someone was at my LGS who goes to school in uh, Utah, and the LG, their local game store is Oasis Games. Oh yeah, and they said they said that the aggro decks are in full force over there. That it's like hammer, burn, prowess all the time. So if there's ever a time to pick back up the amulets, you know. Now's you know, your time. It, it's it's funny. Uh, my playtest group wants everybody to play modern again too and it's like i only have so many days that i can like play paper magic like if i'm gonna play every 1k like i gotta pick a day and then you know we can jam games between between rounds and stuff and like I, standards just my favorite constructed format it probably will be until they bring back extended pioneer baby. <laughs> <laughs> well i i'd be happy to play pioneer uh at this point like I mean, I'm going to have to, right? Because like, that's just one of the formats that get 1Ks. Say it about Pioneer. Do it. <laughs> no, 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 it's just no, a no. dead format. Like People just don't play it. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's so Star funny. Wars you name, you both got your digs, right? Like He got a call that extended. You got to say it was dead. It's like... A... But, but in all honesty, like, uh, I think that I'd love to have more opportunities, but one of the reasons that I'm going to focus on 1Ks is because of the family situation, right? So it's it's kind of like a double-edged sword. Yeah, my next one is kind of a wish list. Like, I left constructive criticism for some personal reasons and stuff like that. Like, we were having 100-plus open events. It was really fun. You know, they were free at that time. We're going to charge $10 this time. But I'd love to get back to that. You know, we're offering the same price support. Plus, I think that there is a need for competitive Magic events and stuff like that. And... You know, leave a comment. Let us know what you guys want that to look like. But I would love to offer something where people can get good competition, you know, four times a year from our events and really test themselves against people with really similar goals. And no, yeah, awesome. that doesn't mean that you two can play. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm already grinding. Uh, I got some friends in Chicago. They're all acting really tough on private Twitter. I just got to show them what, what good Southern boys can do when we call an up there. You know, she's a little Southern hospitality. So I'll let the listeners dodge it for a little while, and I'll, I'll convince Spencer to let me in for one week and you know, kind of show no. them what's up when the time comes. No. But, uh, yeah, I'm really excited for the, uh, the events and stuff like that. It's going to be fun doing those. And Yeah, the first one will be in February. we got to announce a date. The, the other thing that I, I'll say kind of about these is, like, you know, we have not announced an invitational – at the end of it, that doesn't mean it won't happen. Um, so, you know, there could be retroactive stuff that comes. It just kind of depends on how they go. Our main goal for this is to give you guys an outlet as listeners. So if if any of you folk want anything out of this, you know, let us know. Like, that's how this moves forward. But, you know, I, I played some number of those SCGs when I had the opportunity. I played some number of other stuff. Like, I get it that it, for a lot of people, especially people like that are immune compromise like you you are looking for outlets to compete and you know we want to be able to give those to you so my last one is a definite just out of the park wish smack i'm gonna softball it to abe so we can smack out of the park like i really just want pioneer on arena i think that what they've done with historic and alchemy has made my ex arena experience worse i want to love arena but I'm like really close to switching back to MTGO and I would really hope that we can get Pioneer on there and just have more paper analogs on the client so that when I am preparing for a 1K, it becomes a lot easier for me. I don't know. It's definitely a thing that's coming. You know, the team keeps on saying it, but it, it's definitely weird being in the spot right now where it feels like Arena is moving so separate yeah, always just, from, from magic and paper. I'm glad I'm a moto guy because if, if I had any of my one case coming up, there's nothing I can do on arena to prepare for him. You know, like I said, the, the, the three formats sealed pioneer and sealed modern. Pioneer and modern. Those are not it's, things it's you like, really play on the, the thing is, is that sealed deck building is so bad on arena that it's yeah. like almost not worth playing. What they don't want you to know, stay woke Kings and Queens is you export your arena deck to goldfish download it load it up in moto build your sealed pool and then build your deck on arena that's that's the secret they don't tell you that's so frustrating i i think that like honestly like i, I would be pretty happy if they put pioneer on arena i think how much money they make too right like i know they want to do pioneers masters or whatever but like if they just released the draft formats of those sets i mean they'd make infinity dollars so like yeah. 
I think they'll be coming in like what? What did they say? Like two years in their last update on it. Well, they, they announced the delay. Well, I don't know what they said when they announced the delay, right? When they when they basically said they were shutting down Pioneer Masters. I think they said when they like announced Alchemy that had they had they devoted all of their resources to Alchemy instead to Pioneer, it still wouldn't be ready by like this time next year. Is what they by said. The, by that uh, time next okay. year, yeah. So it still wouldn't have been ready. But but now maybe it's probably coming like early twenty twenty three or something. It, it'll still take multiple. I think they probably pioneers. want to launch it all at once, but I don't. I don't know. They they might no, do it like they did with the uh, I, I don't Star Horizons. That's I, all. That's all speculation. That we I, have no idea. My understanding is that there was going to be multiple Pioneer Master sets to get us to Pioneer, just like the Master sets or or the collector I sets. Cross those over with paper too, and run do like Pioneer Masters. Pioneer oh, that'd Masters be that'd be sick. The cards people need, especially for ones that have come out over the last two years add that to my wish pandemic. list let's let's add yeah. this to my wish list like that actually be super sweet trade offer 2023 pioneer horizons simultaneous launch with pioneer and moto and in paper pioneer only cards pioneer coming to arena would offer this analog to paper that i think people crave that historic was offering for like a hot second just immediately went down the train and, and I, I think that people crave that. I think that people want to be able to own their paper Pioneer deck, play it on Arena, and just go to town. Like, if you were to tell people Modern was coming to Arena, the same thing would happen, right? Like, everybody would clamor for it. I don't think that's possible on Arena, and I don't blame Wizards for not wanting to do that, but I do think it's possible for Pioneer, and we should make it happen. I, I think it's coming for, for Arena, for Modern. It, it's it's, it's for Modern? Yeah, 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 yeah. I think it's coming. I think it's a long oh. way away. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. It, it, it's it's not like let's, it's not like anywhere in the next three years. It's okay, like five I was just saying, now. what is the what is the time frame here? Because yeah. let's bet. Because there's yeah, I I would easily take any bet on twenty twenty six. If the podcast is still going by twenty twenty six, we'll be alive by then. Let's bet a year's worth of uh, sponsorship credits from Oasis Games. Oh yeah, I can do so much with that. Okay. Cheek emoji. All right. 20, <laughs> yeah, 2026, January 2026. Hey Siri, set a reminder for January 2026 <laughs> for modern announcement on Arena. <laughs> so, uh, Abe, what are your uh, wish lists or goals? Um, January. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> sorry sorry i had uh my, my friend siri was setting a reminder for my oh, money yeah. <laughs> um so yeah I, I guess i'll kind of start uh with mine that kind of piggybacks a bit off of what <laughs> you're talking about spencer which is um i want there to be more on arena that makes me excited to play it and excited to be good at it and to like get involved with it which is something the latter has really lacked but i've really enjoyed out of uh, i don't know if anyone any of you two have been playing the decathlon events on arena over the last uh week or so now the whole thing culminates in this like one big event where you get to play for like if you get seven wins in this event you get like a set of kamigawa on arena when it comes out and otherwise it's just a bunch of these small cheap different format cues so far i've got two of the like three required tokens to play this this final event uh through doing like a mixed sealed deck of like midnight hunt and crimson vow and doing zendikar bot draft and just, like, things that, you know, really feel cool and rewarding. Like, I've seen a lot of posts on Twitter of people being like, oh, yeah, like, what should I play in this, you know, random constructed event? Like, I'm playing historic, like, artisan, where you can, only, you can play no rares and mythics, only commons and uncommons. Like, what's the best deck? And really just getting into it that way. I think that things like that have been really cool. Uh, you know, just a lot of the midweek magic offerings they like to play. I've really shaken up magic and really been something that I've enjoyed a lot over the year. And so I hope that there's more things like that. And especially Decathlon is such a cool culmination of all of the things that happened in Magic over the last 12 months or whatever, to see those come into play. Uh, I'd really like to see see more of those, just because it does make the whole experience of playing Magic feel a lot a lot cooler in the same way that it's, like a, it's a cool competitive outlet to grind rather than just being a ladder where you grind for a number, because that is kind of a dreary existence to me. If I'm playing ladder this month, it's basically just to get a game in. Mostly, yeah. uh, I've just been playing in traditional events and standard and historic and a little bit of alchemy i have no interest in playing the arena bbdq i have no interest in the last day grind <laughs> to yeah. get the arena bbdq stuff uh one of the reasons like for me that i'm considering going back to mt joe is like 
you know, they renewed the um, the mocks. Yeah, they renewed the, the they renewed series. the mocks this year, and it's like, well, you know what? I've actually never tried to do this. You know, I don't I don't have the time that like people like uh, you know misplaced ginger have or whatever. But like, you don't have all day to do nothing. Yeah, I don't. I you know I have <laughs> a job. Seasonal unemployment. I, I have a job and. I wasn't say a life, but that actually sounded really rude because, like, you know, the the things that he does. It's allowed to be rude to Derek here. <laughs> I still think that like trying to qualify for the mocks would be really fun for me, and I think that what you're saying about like getting excited to log into Arena is something that I, I've also been lacking. So I, it really resonates with me. It's interesting to me the my relationship with Arena because of the energies and stuff, and I'm dedicating so much time to those and so much like for lack of a better word, money to do them because they are quite far from me. I need to fly to them for the most part. I have one that's drivable. It makes it so I should play Modern more and Legacy more, which you can't play on Arena, obviously, until 2026. And 2020, in 2032, respectively, of course. It Hello, everybody, makes... and welcome to the new joke of the Constructive Criticism Podcast. <laughs> oh You'll be hearing it for three years. <laughs> yeah, I can't wait to get this money. I'm going to buy all my legacy cards so that when they come on Arena, I can have those too to practice. No, but, uh, you know, I, I'm like playing, I'm playing these things, and it's like, okay, well, why should I play Arena, right? Because, like, I'm streaming, and it's like, okay, like, something has to give at a certain point, and Arena is just the one where it's just like, okay, there's nothing to really get from this because it isn't time efficient for any of the ways to get to the per tour if that's your thing. So I don't really want to do it that way, right? Like if I want to do that sort of thing, it's better to spend like 12 hours playing a Moto PTQ. It's harder, but it's a one shot. You know, it doesn't take like a whole day right. and then a whole other weekend. Dude, MT- so. MTG is the new Super Smash Bros. Melee. Basically the same thing at this point. If we could only be so lucky. Dude, I, I'm <laughs> I, I'm just saying like that's that's basically what it is, right? It's like the old guard. It's way harder. Barrier to entry is higher. But it's better competition. It's your more- APM has to be high. You've got to know exactly <laughs> all your tech skills. No flubbing. No one likes it when you time them out. You like, know, aspiring spec yeah. is mango. Uh- <laughs> I, I, I really, I'm, I'm actually, obviously, like, it's kind of a joke, but kind of serious, right? Like, Yeah, I know. It, it, it would be nice to have a reason to play Arena outside of I write articles that are, like, Arena-focused, yeah. and we talk about Arena on this. Well, we talk about formats that are the quickest to play on arena because the, it does take longer, I think to play games on of standard on uh, magical line than arena. And a lot of the times it's not really about finding what's the best in the format. It's about finding or to find out like that all the nitty gritty, it's getting the information to y'all so that, you know, you can do with it what you can. And often I can tell, I can get, I can get you the big idea of what it is and all that sort of stuff. I can't get to the point where I'm like, yeah, no, I mean, you play frog moth on six with snake skin veil. So you can, you know, blah, 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 blah. Like I could have been invitational, but yeah. that's just not going to happen. You know, so uh, outside of, of that arena stuff, I think it's funny that both of you brought up the pro tour stuff, because obviously I think something that all three of us would love to see, would be a return of organized play. I specifically have been feeling what I want to see more than I want to see, like a big grand return of the pro tour. Cause I just frankly don't think that, the climate of the world is such that we should be doing that. The the whole like traveling, inviting everyone to travel all the time. It, it's just not, not necessarily consistent or safe this year, but I would love to see, especially as these things have been, you know, going, okay, the NRG is regional level and the local level tournament play to come back in, in a way that's supported by Wizards of Coast. What, what I have it said in like my note is like a PPTQ like system, but you know, something as simple as store championship like event they, they, they did these for the store champions they gave around the promos you give out but like what if your game day could be scheduled anytime your store championship could be scheduled anytime in the quarter and then every store has a store championship and then the winners of those store championships on your local level they can play some state championship that qualifies for some regional championship that qualifies for some national championship and just something that really brings back a real like grassroots energy of people who are just excited to be playing and trying to win at magic being able to do that on a local and increasingly small and selective regional and national level in a way that you know could be manageably done safely with, with just some support from lots because i know that especially from my time working in lgs you know what i still see at the lgs is i'm able to go to the pptqs the the bread and butter like this is a thing that every player who cares wants to wants to show up to those ones really are huge for the lgs's and for the players to be able to 
have that sense of community and have the sense of the game being a, a big and cool thing to chase. And I think that especially after so many years of being kind of on ice, uh, it, it feeling cool and being cool is kind of like a, a big thing I want to see. And so I think that would go a long way to it. I don't know how you guys feel about that kind of proposition. Did when they moved from the PBTQs back to PTQs, I remember that first PTQ. It was in Boise, Idaho. I was playing Gruel Warriors. Just the energy in that room was through the roof. People who had never gotten to play in an old school PTQ showed up. And people were just hyped, dude. It was, oh my gosh, I was so sick of PBTQs. They were the worst. This is so great. So many people were like making plans to travel to the next one after they got their second loss. Like, hey, like you want to go to this one in this city? Like, I've never done anything in my life like the PTU scene. And and like talking to players of other competitive games, whether it be Yu-Gi-Oh or Smash Bros, there just wasn't anything like it. Like I know poker pros that like do those ladder tournaments. It, it's just not the same. And maybe I'm naive. Maybe I'm wishing for something that's not possible. I'd give anything for it. Like it's how I made my best friends in the entire world. I, I might cry. I'm, of, I'm not gonna lie. I might, I might cry thinking about it. I I don't blame you, man. Like the I, I agree with you. Having having also been a, a PTQ rounder, the the experience of being in tournament halls full of people who just want to win and who just want to get better and who just want to be there to compete. It's it's one of the best. I personally think that like kind of a lot of the faults of the PPTQ system are kind of in a spot right now where they would they could be huge strengths. The things where people like feel like they had to play on a local level. There's not as much of like a oh well my friend who's like bronze already can't play because there is none of that. And without that, I think there will be time for a PTQ system when I think Wizards is a better idea of what OP looks like. But I would really just love to see the small ball stuff, the the store level with a, with a bit of aspiration, just a little bit of a carrot don't, on a stick. Don't get me wrong. I also love GPTs, man. Like, GPTs were the nuts, too. So I don't know if, Mason, you have any thoughts or if that's... Uh... Yeah, it's interesting to me. I mean, I didn't... You know, I came in and PPTQs were the thing that you played, right? I played a, a good amount of PTQs. I know, not like a large amount. Nothing compared to y'all. I mean, it's like, you know, barely in the double digits. But, you know, high conversion rate from there. No, but just... No, I, I think, uh, I think like, <laughs> RPTQs basically add up to what a PTQ felt like for what it's worth. Yeah, most of my wish list for it is just that, you know, something something where it feels like a something that builds to a something that builds to a something from the very ground up. Because I, I think that's really what the Magic community needs right now. I, I think it's what... When I think of the competitive Magic players around me, it's what they really want to feel like organized play gives to them. And, and that's really all I want, is that the people who are really involved really get to feel like their involvement takes them somewhere forward. Yeah. You know? it, it, it's funny hearing you talk about that. Cause as you're doing it, my LGS owner is actually messaging. I can see it on Facebook at the corner of my eye, but my, my LGS is kind of doing this thing like that. We keep mentioning smash brothers here, I guess because we all know the scene well enough, but I, I think grassroots stuff on like the local level, I think is a great way to kind of like simulate that. And I hope that store can do things like uh, my LGS, the one I played every week, the game cave, they're doing a thing where for their modern tournaments, they have a Wednesday and a Thursday, and your match points uh, that you get are put on the leaderboard at the end of the season, which shows season, I think he says four months, or maybe it's three months. I'm not exactly sure. It's actually starting this Sunday. So it's like, you're going to be top 16, top 16 is going to play, and he's increasing the price pool, or the, the entry for all the tournaments by $2. But all that $2 is going back into the thing. Because everyone's been saying, like, yeah, I really want this, like, I wish something more competitive, I wish something like this. And he is somebody who used to play. He actually, like, was playing before I was, but not that that much, but he played PTQs and stuff. And like he played the Pro Tours and that sort of thing, and he wants there to be something like that. And, you know, we're hopeful and we've talked about, like, yeah, we have a couple other stores from various parts of Tennessee, and it'd be great if, like, if this works well for us, he says, like, I would love to have those other stores emulated for their areas and then, like, have, like, you know, end of the year, like, this is the winner from quarter one, two, three, and four from each of these four stores held at this location, you know, and, like, do something just to get people excited about Magic in, like, the the Tennessee area. And, you know, Tennessee's wide enough that we can actually do that without, like, really cutting into each other's markets too much, you know, about, yeah. like, which store to go to. So it's, it's really uh, it's really exciting. It's something that, you know, like, I want there to be stuff like that. And, and I love to see, like, people who are – Newer to Magic, you know, kind of these COVID Magic babies that found it via Arena looking for something to do during the pandemic. You know, they're really excited to play these sort of things. Like uh, the Store Championship was like a big deal to a lot of them. They were, the Store Championship was cool and I was excited to play something like that. 
I was excited. These people it was like, this was the biggest thing they had ever played. And they were like really wanting to do well. And they were really practicing. They were really trying to put effort in. And that made me want to put effort in. Cause I was like, you know, I want to like give them the best whatever, but also like their excitement got it going. And I, I think that's sort of stuff is uh, doable at the store level too. So I don't know. A little behind the scenes. One of the things that when talking about doing the CCMTG open series sponsored by Oasis games, Alex Sittner, the owner of Oasis was, Curious if we were willing to do something at at the U- local Utah level at Oasis. I think we want to focus on getting this community grown again. I don't. I, I said we weren't opposed to to that that local level stuff, but you know, the, my other hosts are in other parts of the world in the nation. So it's like, I get it though. I get what he's coming from. He's like he wants to sponsor something for Oasis to from the podcast and have us organize it and and help out with it. So. I, I think that there is clearly a want from a lot of different places and it's possible that it does become, you know, we'll bring up the smash analogy again, but like it's possible it has to be the same thing that happened with, with smash. And it just has to be us to, that does it. I, for, I'm actually kind of firmly in the belief that magic will do better once we're divorced from Watsy more. And that's not to be like a Watsy's terrible at their job type situation. I'm not trying to dig on them like that. I just think that, they are really good at those other things and other people can be good at these different things. And it puts a lot of pressure for them to be in charge of all this for like no real reason. And the incentive it's hard for them to make all these incentives that line up with what's best for the stores. And it's like, if you can do these things on the grassroots level, you can get some big stuff. And so I think that's why things like SCG NRG, those sort of things are so big and important for magic because it gives them people another thing to do. And Watsi, and Watsi, to their credit, was like providing pro tour invites to those things. You know, like before COVID, you want an SCG, you got a pro tour invite. You want one of the face-to-face things, you got an invite. And I think so. I think those will come back. I, I do think mm-hmm. that to Abe's point, though, while I agree with what you're saying, that like these, there needs to be some grassroots stuff. And I think they were trying to encourage that by giving face-to-face the pro tour invite, by giving SCG the, the invite. Hopefully in the future, NRG gets that invite. You know, one of my goals long term was eventually for us to get that kind of invite when I was running those events before COVID. I think that those are great long term goals for grassroots movements. But I do think that there needs to be if there's a national championship, right, for Magic the Gathering in every nation or whatever or in every region, however they're going to do it. I think that that does need wizard support to get there. I don't want to make it sound like wizard needs to yeah. pee poo for whatever, but. We need a Smash Summit. That that's what it comes down to. If you watch Melee, dude, you holy watch crap! Ultimate. Can you can you imagine like if we had an MTG Summit? That'd be sick. We'd get to pick whatever formats we want. Oh yeah, I was gonna say the side events to be hot. Can you just imagine like all these people that are trash talking their basketball games finally having to put up on camera? <laughs> uh, what was your last one, Abe? Yeah, my last one. Uh, this one is a much more personal goal of. Uh, just getting back into writing more about magic. Something I really like to do, even, you know, around the time that I started writing for Star City when I did, you know, something I still have a, have a big passion for. Kind of, this has been ignited by uh, my friend Kyle, who has been doing a bunch of reading of, like, classic articles that have come out over the years that he's just missed. Things that are just kind of the foundation of, like, you know, you're really starting to dive in magic theory articles. He was talking about how he was so excited about, like, reading about, like, a the different decks of these time periods and like seeing things laid out with these decks as examples and how they were just things he'd never thought of before. These decks he didn't know existed. Like the history of the game was really very well preserved in these articles for him. And then he was able to to access it. And it just got me thinking about how like, especially with the state of content now and like how people just either aren't reading articles or the articles are really bare bones, really like, you know, deckless sideboard guide, everything I know about blank all. All the stuff that kind of makes it feel watered down that if I could really start writing more and just adding my experiences and some of these things that are kind of lost to the lack of tournament coverage, lost to the lack of interest in the content. If I could br- make sure that that has a place that, you know, five, ten years from now, someone who looks back at this era of magic, like has something to reference or, or you know, that, that it exists out there. And I can know that, like, we're not just as a culture kind of like not recording the things that that matter to us uh, that has kind of really gotten me thinking a lot about it. And I want to want to be a part of that and want to be a part of supplying the kinds of insights about magic, uh, either on big or small levels that I have to, to offer more consistently. Cause I feel like I've kind of uh, slacked on that for a while. It, it does matter a lot to me. So 
Maybe I could steal your writing gig. Let me think about that, Abe. Maybe I want you. I don't know. I get that a lot. Don't worry, Abe. Uh, maybe, I don't. Maybe I don't want. I don't want Masons. Oh, 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 sorry. I the, I meant the part where they say maybe they want six two and single. It is interesting to me how well, relative to what the like exposure should be on these sort of things, that like the Google Docs get on Twitter. Where like if you were to look at like the likes, and I bet if you look at like the clicks and impressions, like Twitter shows you, that it would be much better than like you would expect, but not insane. But you know, like there is a fever for that sort of stuff. And like last night I posted on Twitter and I was like, hey, are there any like eleven page Google Docs you know about like Bring to Light or Yawgmoth and stuff like that that I can read? And because you know people write that sort of stuff and they just don't get picked up by. Uh, what content websites or you know someone's doing them in the hopes of getting picked up by a TCG player or a card kingdom and I, I got one sent to me that was like I think 12 pages about Yawgmoth you know and it was uh, in a lot of detail and while that's kind of different than what you're saying it is kind of in that vein of like hey like this is kind of this thorough thing breaking down the real intricacies and like every little itty bitty thing and uh, yeah I, I think there should be stuff like that and you know even like the bigger picture stuff like you talk about like that, that is essentially all I know about all dog one part yeah. right it feels different to me at least you know where like it was definitely targeted towards like hey you're someone who's trying to commit a lot of time to yog you're not someone who's trying to like read an article while at lunch you know so. yeah yeah I mean I, I this kind of stemmed from a conversation I've also been having with my brother who's recently getting into hearthstone and legends of Runeterra where he was saying that like the Legends of Runeterra content versus the Hearthstone content, Hearthstone content is so much, he like want to play Arena, and it's so much like, oh, pick this card, it has the highest win rate, or pick these heroes, or you know mulligan this way with these decks, and it's very shallow content. He was like, I don't, there's no content anymore about how I'm supposed to value the cards when they're in play, or what I'm supposed to trade off and stuff. And he was saying with Runeterra, there's so much nuance in, in a lot of it either because of and he wasn't sure if it was either because the players who are writing are more involved or if the game is more complex and therefore there's more to talk about there's more interactions you know when i look at magic content i almost feel like most of it is more of the first stuff it's like yeah you know board like this against this deck because they want to do this and it's like th there's there's so little about what it means to be someone who's competing especially during like during covid uh i feel like that's like a huge collective consciousness thing that a, a lot of pro magic players have gone through that isn't well recorded i think there's like tons of stuff about all of these decks that have come out that aren't just surface level you know the, the time you take to write a nine page doc yeah. about yogmoth you're gonna say every little thing about it and all these things that you can't say in a 2000 2200 word article for a major content site that that stuff goes such a long way and hearing kyle talk about the mono red sly versus suicide black matchup as broken down by mike flores in the case of like who's the beat down meant like was so cool to him and was so awesome to him i can't help but think that in three to five years there's going to be an entire era of magic where that doesn't exist and that really bothers me so i, I i'm hoping that this gets kind of get more in gear about being a part of preserving that so i'm going to switch cameras for those watching on YouTube, and this is like the YouTube deep cut, we're going to go to just the screen so I can show people what my favorites bar looks like. But we have CCMTG, we got Halo, and we got Smash, and we got Magic on my favorites bar. And on my Smash bar is a list of characters and the content associated with those characters. And when you go to Greninja, there's a thing called the Greninja Resources Doc. And when you click it, it is a, oh man, I can't see the number of pages. I think, oh, it's 21 pages with every single Greninja video. It is oh, he's back. absolutely <laughs> insane. I didn't mean to cut these guys off, but like it's, it's the super deep cut where these guys literally couldn't hear what I was saying, but we're going to have to listen to the episode now. <laughs> yeah. You guys are going to have to listen for the, the super deep cut. But what Abe is saying is true where the, you have to care a lot about the specific thing and, and so much of magic content creation has become give me a sideboard guide and a deck list rather than teach me to fish, right? Like, and I hope that this podcast can always stay in that teach me to fish uh, vein. So it's a hard vein to stay in, too. You know what I mean? We have these conversations, but like, this is me kind of talking to the listeners. The listeners out there, like, yeah, I wish there was more teach me to fish stuff or like, I, I kind of wish there was more stuff like that. The uh, thing is, is that the teach me to fish stuff doesn't get the clicks. 
It does not get the clicks. It does not get the hits. And uh, whether people like it or not, a lot of those major websites are driven by clicks or whatever. And bigger number, better person is the joke, but it is true when it comes to your article click rates or whatever. And so uh, you have to vote with your time. And so if you like that sort of stuff, you don't have time to read the whole article. Click on the links and stuff. You know, boost those numbers a little bit, baby. I'm, yeah. I'm just going to say, we have some Turning Grounds episodes coming up soon. You got to smash that like button when you see them if you want more of them. Because, like, that's how we get sponsors. You know, we're, we're lucky, right? Like, we're doing a podcast that you you guys are the patrons. You guys are the YouTube subscribers. And we don't answer to to Big Daddy click views, right? Like, we answer to ourselves, and, and so, like, as those come up, smash that like button. But also, like, when Abe writes that article, leave a comment, share it. That's how you get more of that stuff. Burn down the all I know about deck articles. <laughs> is that, is that, that was your third point, right? Abe, I'm not kind of... Yeah, no, that was that was it for me, was was just wanting to get back into writing because I think that keeping that stuff around is important. Got to, someone's yeah. got to do it. That's going to do it for our main topic. That was really fun to talk about. I hope the listeners got something from all that different stuff and maybe got thinking about different stuff. A little more, uh, all the articles we want. No, just joking. <laughs> Time to show. But we do have a Patreon question. And if you want to support the show, you can go to patreon.com slash ccmtg. The show will always be free. But if you want to support the show, if you like you got something out of it, you can go there. You got tiers from like one to fifteen dollars, I think now. And I believe if you subscribe at the ten dollar tier, you're going to get into the tournament for free, and that's ten dollars. So you're kind of getting in there for free. So if you're already going to do that, you might as well do it now. Get your spot reserved. Get in there. You also get access to you know the Patreon Discord. You get to ask questions like the one we're about to answer on the show right now, and you do get the pre-show mic check, which typically is like you know a couple minutes of just chit chatting sometimes about stuff like arcane i definitely forgot to record the mic check this week i'm sorry uh, you're good i actually was curious because you went to go do the bathroom a little behind the scenes with having i was like i wonder if he's recording us for the mic check, <laughs> mic check when we got back. uh <laughs> but i was like yeah you know whatever it happens it happens you know we're in the holidays whatever give us a break i could have an episode this week get what you have kids but we do have a question from or one of our patrons uh adrian adrian says any advice on time management and efficiency for those who work full-time or have parents, or our parents, sorry, or just whatever I'm busy with life and love magic and want to get the most out of their little magic time. As someone who hits all three of these, do you have any tips, whatever? Because I, I definitely have some stuff, and I'm sure Abe does too. I, the number one thing that I would say is to focus on an individual goal at a time. So, like, if your goal is top 1500 mythic, that's your goal. That's what you're focusing on. If your goal is improving at magic, I probably wouldn't touch the ladder. Like, straight up, actually would not do it. I think that you're better off playing events, playing on Arena, even though you're going to play against, a lot of times, worse competition, worse decks. It is actually still better for you to take the time to sit through an event and then have a pre- and post-event check-in and, like, analyze than it is to play, like, 10 matches on ladder. If your goal is top 1500 Mythic, and you're a drafter. I actually think ladder is a great way to get the best competition and get the number of drafts in that you need to get in. So it, it really depends. But focus on one thing at a time and then decide how long you're going to focus on that thing. Whether it be the arena ladder month, whether it be you know each quarter or things like that, you actually have to set aside time. The number of times where I've been like to my wife, hey, I have not played magic this week i need to go play x number of matches with these decks for the podcast to have to be able to have an understanding of them and you know one of my goals uh, i did a quest for 10 series on youtube for a while and the goal of that was like i wanted to get 10 wins with every deck and that was because i wanted to be able to say like here here's what i learned from whether that be 10 or 20 or 30 matches it was never that much but like here here's what i learned um and here's what you can take away from that and I think that each thing that you do in your life, and people hate to hear this, but having kids makes you worse at your job. Having a job makes you worse at magic. It's just true. Like, there's there's not getting around it because you have to ignore one thing to do the other. There's only so many hours in the day. And it sucks to hear that, but it's true. And Mike Sigrist will tell you that. Seth Manfield will tell you that. Like... It's just the way life works. So it's about managing your time. And if you want to manage it the best, it's about focus. 
It's about drive. It's about power. It's no. I'm, uh, <laughs> Let's go. I was like, I was like to take that from you. Let's go. I, I, yeah, had, I, to, I had to do it before Mason said it, but it really is about like, you know, if I'm going to tune a blue blacklist, which is something that I did this week, you know, how how am I going to do that? What what is the goal going into this specific match? What is the goal going into this? And it's exhausting, but it's really helpful in in allocating your time to specific goals because you can't do it any other way. I, I know that for me, like after having my kid, I, t- I took a small, it was right after, you know, qualifying for the pro tour. And I took a short break. I, I, I didn't know what to do next and, and how to get back to the pro tour. But, uh, you know, I think the best tournament of magic I've ever played was actually an RP, the team RTP, RPTQ. I knew that I was going to be put on blue white. And I think that I probably played that blue white bet- deck better than any deck that I have ever played, but I had a goal in mind and I knew that the time that I spent had to be dedicated to that goal. And there's, there's not something else you can do. And I know that sounds like boring, but that's kind of what you have to do when you have a job and a kid. Otherwise you're just kind of aimlessly playing and it's okay to have aimless time, right? It's okay to say like, I'm done with standard. I just need to do a draft or I need to go jump on my Nintendo switch for an hour. You just have to recognize that that hour is taking away from something else. It sounds sad because it is sad, but that's just how life works. Yeah. It was what I was going to say. And I'm glad you kind of brought this up is that I think a really important thing is being honest with yourself with what your goals are and what your relationship with magic are and to kind of take actions according to that. So, and, and mind you, I think this is really important. This kind of gets, I feel like lost on my Spyco Prathen brethren, but uh, and sisters. But it's okay to like casually engage with magic and still listen to things like this and want to be like as competitive on top of things as you can and still just be like, yeah, I play like you know ten matches of arena in a week or whatever. Right? Like that's fine. And your your relationship costs to be like, yeah, I play my weekend win a box every you know Saturday, or whatever, from modern or standard, or whatever it is, you know, or draft, and like. That's good. Just come to terms and be honest with yourself about what it is. Because if your goal is to get better and you are someone who is, you know, working a full-time job or does have a kid or is in a committed relationship, you know, you should be thinking about, okay, what is the best way for me to improve at Magic? And is it actually playing Magic? Because my guess is, is the answer is you shouldn't be playing Magic during that time if you actually are trying to improve at Magic. And there are better things you should be doing, which isn't very fun to hear. And it sounds like doing your homework. But it, it comes down to like, okay, are my goals to like play pro tours when they come back? Yeah. Or is my goal to like keep my head above water at my LGS winner boxes, like going infinite on store credit? Both are great goals and they're awesome ways to interact with magic. But be honest with yourself and the things you do will be different for those things. Yeah, I, I really want to add on to what you just said because I think that it it, it feels like homework because it is homework. Two, at least two days a week outside of when me going to Oasis on Wednesdays. And even when I don't go to Oasis on Wednesdays, I still make the time to play magic is so two days a week outside of Wednesdays is homework time. Like I am, I'm playing arena. I am looking at deck lists or watching videos. If I'm doing something else, like I watched every single Mason Clark YouTube video while playing Valheim last week, while his play was really bad playing red, blue dragons, like actually horrendous. Uh, wanted to make sure to say that on the show. It is okay to do multiple things at once, right? If you're listening to this podcast and you're driving, right? That That is you trying to take a shortcut. But you have to recognize that it is a shortcut. It does not have the same value as putting in those games. And doing that homework is really important. And when coming back to this show and when doing Mythic Cast, right? If you guys noticed, when I did Mythic Cast, if you're a Mythic Cast listener that moved back over here... I hit Mythic every month when I went back to Mythic Cast. I have not hit Mythic since. Why, why is that, Mason? You could probably tell it's them. It's not your goal. It's not my goal anymore, right? Like, so you just have to be honest. Like, what are you trying to do? And then you have to dedicate the time to do that thing. If your goal is to top eight your 1K, okay. What format is your 1K? What are you, how are you playing it? If your goal is to do well at an NRG event, if your goal is to qualify for the Pro Tour, you have to be realistic about what is it and then do the proper homework. It sucks because eventually magic becomes less fun because you're not learning as much as you were. And you hit those plateaus, right? 
or even worse than when you're in the plateau is when you actually get worse again because you hit that plateau for so long before you get to go up again. Those are the real hard moments, right, Abe? The part where it gets worse before it gets better is is definitely tough. And, you know, any part of improving things, part of part of that getting worse is just you seeing more and more because you're sitting at this plateau thinking about it for so much. I think you two covered it really well. You do have to be very realistic with yourself with your goals, really honest about the time you have to commit and what you can do with it. I think learning to love doing the homework is huge. I think that probably my biggest level up of the last few years was right before the pandemic where I realized that I was like, you know, I was having a very strong, still below what I wanted out of myself uh, performance on the SDG tour, you know, despite these solid finishes every weekend, I was like, man, I'm doing all of this theoretical stuff and it's all working, but like some stuff is missing. And so adding in that first bit more of playing, so I was so focused with balancing a full-time like schedule at school and, you know, just my life uh, on top of that, that introducing more time to play for me was actually best. But for most people, like 99% of people who want to get better at magic and don't have a lot of time, the thing to do is to make sure the magic time you're spending, you're spending in ways that are so much more than playing magic because you get so much more out of a lot of thinking and then a little bit of playing to see it kind of in motion than you do out of, out of the other way around. And it's a lot easier to fit in more time to think too. driving lunch, breakfast, like any time that you can have time to, I would read SCG articles on the bus to school and I would, now I listen to podcasts everywhere I'm driving, no matter when, even if it's just for five minutes up the street to pick up a prescription, it, you just find the time to, to get that stuff in and that, that's the best way to go. I did this three yeah. times in October and November, but I plan on continuing to do it. I'll just let people know because it's not posted on the Patreon is that I do stream in the Patreon. I did it twice in October, once in November. I've been really busy due to the holidays, but I will continue to do that where people can literally just jump in and play magic with me as patrons. I haven't been doing it just because like I, I've not been playing magic at time where times where I can do that. But those are the moments like I've been doing it with my friends right now. Uh, because, you know, it, it doesn't bug me when my kid walks up when I'm with Quentin and Matt. But, like, those moments where you get to, like, get in a room with somebody and do those things are going to be really helpful for you, Adrian, and anybody else listening. You get three brains working on the same problem, right? Like, Abe and I, I don't know when our video is about to come. I'm sure that he's editing it right now. But, like, Abe and I, we're going to time out every freaking game. Just because you have, you have a lot of opinions, but you're learning so much. Uh, it, I think it's really important. Yeah, I spent four hours on a two and a half hour long canister VOD watching him win the, sh- the showcase. I, believe- I always get the names wrong for these things, but I believe it was the showcase yeah. for Legacy because I have a Legacy tournament coming up. And I was like, well, maybe, I- maybe I'm going to play a deck like Reanimator. I'm not going to play Reanimator now, but like did what I needed to do, right? I'd like put in the four hours and I play the league. When the the Vegas Legacy thing happened and I was mm-hmm. playing like, 73 of Reed Duke's 75. I like legit watched every match of Reed Duke GP with other people too. And like talked about lines and sideboard plans and like it's homework. Carmen actually had a tweet about this, like not that long ago where uh, they talked about like playing magic, having deck lists open when their opponent was like taking time on arena. It's like, okay, let's shift focus. Like let's look at deck lists. Multitasking can happen, but also just, understanding the the number of avenues and tools that you have and then figuring out which tools you need for the goals that Mason mentioned earlier is really important. Yeah, Carmen is a psychopath. I don't know if you've ever heard them talk about how they would play with their three monitors with the one in front of them yeah, being I have. Arena or MPGO. <laughs> to the left is the deck list, and to the right is two Twitch VODs on top yeah, of each other, yeah. like a multi-stream the number, mode. I, I want to know how, how they do the Twitch VODs one. Because like, I, I always, like when I'm playing Arena, I always have, like whether it's a Magic the Gathering podcast or like something going on over here, I don't know how to do two Twitch things. Like, I don't know. I, I didn't know it was tabs. Like, like today I played a, a, a Yawgmoth League and had, like, uh, Ginger and Eyelash open at the same time. But, like, I, I had the tab between them. So I, well, I can't he- read the board states when they're small. Henry did that but, stream with doing three drafts last week. It reminded me, there's, like, a line where, you know, Selena Gomez is asked if she would live forever. And she's like, if you could mm-hmm. look like this, you wouldn't do it? Like, this looks pretty good. She's like, I can barely do it now. And, like, that's how I feel, like, doing one draft. And Henry's <laughs> out here doing three. It's like, I barely do one, Henry. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> anyway, I hope that answered your question, Adrian. 
Thank you all so much for listening to this week's episode of Constructed Criticism. If you want to find me, you can find me on Twitter at Mason E. Clark. You can find me each and every week on Clark Kingdom. You can find me on YouTube.com slash Mason Clark MTG and on Twitch.tv slash The Mason Clark. I don't think I said that one. It's getting hard to keep track of everything, but I stream there. I think it's Tuesday through Saturday is the times, 9 p.m. Central. So check it out. We're going to find you, Spencer. You can find me at Spencer H. You can find me next. I mean, we're coming up on the end of the year, guys. I will be doing YouTube content pretty hard next year. Uh, it should be pretty fun. So check that out, whether it's the Conjured Grism YouTube channel or the He's a Game Media YouTube channel. Uh, and then, yeah, you can find me in the queues on MTGO some some amount of time next year. So What are you, Abe? Uh, you can find me on Twitter.com slash more nothings. DMs are still open for coaching on Hammer. It's still going to be a great time. Look at misplaced gingers gotten thirty seven yeah, and six. I tried to tell him. I tried to tell him to get on hammer. That's He's really heard you good. talk about it a bunch. I can't say that it's not fair to say he got free coaching from you. I think I, you should, actually you should him up out those chesties. I think we saying. both. I think we both know he paid. And I guess I'll plug uh, wordpress.com slash much abe do about nothings, which was my my pre working for SCG blog, which I'll have to revive this year in in line with my goals. So that's where people can find. Thank you all so much for listening. We'll see you next year for another episode of Constructed Criticism.